and anybody knows anything ab- about us, we're, we, we're givers. And I like to just give presents away. And I've got a couple Bibles here I'm just wondering if anybody could use. This is a uh, really beautiful black and brown life application study Bible. It's in the New Living Translation. And uh, I'm just wondering who really, really, I mean, now if you have a good Bible, you know, but who really needs a good study Bible that you can, life application, you can take every scripture and apply it to your life. Raise your hand if you would like this. Young lady, this is yours. Can someone come up and get it and bring it to her? Is that Miranda back there? Is that your name, sweetie? Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations, Miranda. Enjoy. And then I have a second one, and this is a pretty good one, too. This is, it's God's Word for Students. It's also a study Bible, and it's, uh, this is uh, used. I'm not sure whose it was, but it was donated. And who would like this? This is God's Word for Students. And who, anybody? Like a good Bible? It's leather? Yeah, come on up. This is yours. Yeah, here, this is Kristen. Thank you. God bless you, Kristen. Enjoy that. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for that. We we love giving stuff away. All right. uh, Merry Christmas to you. That's those are Christmas gifts. All right. How you guys? You guys look different than you did last week. You look like I was going to say fatter, but uh, (laughs) did did any did anybody eat a lot for Thanksgiving? What's different is that you guys look like olives stuffed in a pickle jar this week. <laughs> I think we all ate pretty good. I mean, who over ate? Just conf- confession's good for the soul. All right. <laughs> well, now we got all week to diet, and then comes Christmas. Uh, I heard a funny story this week. I, I like to start with that. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we, we. Yeah, Ohio State destroyed Michigan, and how many of you are happy about that? Yeah, ah, yeah that's good. One of my favorite ads, it was years ago, but I watched it again yesterday. It's uh, a guy in an Ohio State sweatshirt and a girl in a Michigan sweatshirt, and they're kissing and just, you know, real sweet on each other, and then the, the camera pans away, and then there's just a little blurb at the bottom of the screen, and it says, if it wasn't for sports, this wouldn't be so disgusting. <laughs> How true is that? And uh, All right, so I heard a funny story. There was a, a black guy and a white guy they met in church who became really good friends, good buddies. They liked to talk sports together and have lunch once in a while. And, but they were always arguing, it was a competitive thing, about whether Jesus is, is black or white. And they just, you know, arguing, we'll find out one day who's right, you know, is that kind of a thing. They would talk trash to each other. Well, as it so happens, they died on the same day. They went to heavens, and they ran up to the pearly gates. They couldn't wait to find out. So they saw Peter said, Peter, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? we got to see him. And then all of a sudden, Jesus walks up, and he reaches out his hand. And he says, buenos dias, como estas? (laughs) All right. All right. We need to pray after that, don't we? All right, why don't you grab somebody's hand, and let's pray as we get into the Word of God together. Father, thank you for your Holy Word. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which even now is active. Wow. When you touch the Word with your Spirit, God, it becomes life to us. We're asking you to do that. Touch the this preaching, the teaching, the reading of your Word today. Change every life in this place so we can make a difference in our world. We can live different lives for for your glory's sake. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right. So today's title, uh, it's a a little bit of a weird title. It's being real and avoiding spiritual sounding platitudes. Being real and avoiding, uh, Dave loves these kind of messages. He's already grinning. And avoiding spiritual sounding platitudes. Platitudes. Notice I didn't say spiritual platitudes. I said spiritual sounding platitudes. What's a platitude? A platitude is uh, a lazy statement. Is it up on screen? It's devoid of any real thought. That's what makes it lazy. 
It's devoid of any emotion or even current factuality. It gives a false impression of wisdom. It sounds hollow to a discerning person. It's similar to a truism. It says nothing fresh, nothing interesting. It's just a repetition kind of thing. A platitude is even worse than a cliche because it can lull us into accepting things that are actually false and foolish. Uh, I knew a pastor years ago, really nice guy. He was leading, uh, we were in the Assemblies of God for a while. We're not a part of that anymore, but we were there for 15 years. We joined, we started independent, we joined, then we came out. And uh, the person that was leading the the pastors in this area, this is the guy I'm talking wonderful guy. He did a good job leading the meetings, the pastor's meetings once a month. But I would ask him, how are you doing? I'm not going to use his real name. Let's call him Bob. i say, how are you doing, Bob? And he would say, well, Mike, praise the Lord. And I would go, well, no, how are you doing, really? I just, you know. But every single time, say, well, praise the Lord. Now, is it wrong to praise the Lord? But I, I'm a caring person. I really wanted to know how he's doing. Good, bad, indifferent. I, I wanted to pray for him, encourage him. But that's all I would get. And, uh, and I, there are a lot of people that are like that. And people get like that. They, they don't start like that. When people get saved, they're pretty truthful. They're pretty honest. And then people like me mess them up. <laughs> Preachers, we're the worst ones. Preachers mess, they, they help people, but we can mess them up just as bad at the same time and so he was coached to be like that now to me that's not real that's not being real I know you can't just you know spill your guts on every person you meet on the street or even in your church but there are people that you can trust that are mature they're loving they're compassionate you can share what's really going on with them you know in your life one of my favorite is being blessed how you doing being blessed See, now that's not a bad statement. I hope you are being blessed. But if you're not, it's a lie. If you're not in that state, it's, it's a lazy thing to say that it becomes hollow after a while. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Being blessed, you know. There's other commonly used platitudes. Uh, just give it over to the Lord. Well, you've got a, somebody's got a crisis. And people, just give it a, in our first church it was, well, just praise the Lord, brother. You know, I just want to smack you in the face, brother. <laughs> That's kind of trite for what I'm going through at this moment here. I need a little bit more. Another one is just trust God. See, these are th some of these platitudes make you even feel guilty. You feel like a, a spiritual schmo, right? Like you just don't measure up. Have faith. Uh, how about this one? Just surrender more of your life to Jesus. Now these are good statements in the right context when they're when it's the right time when, you know but other times these are these can kill you let go and let god i mean these are they're they're worse than clichés they're not bad sayings in and of themselves but when somebody especially a pastor is not really listening to you or caring what you're going through and he laz lazily just throws one of these babies out at you you know it just means nothing. It's like getting hit with a big fuzzball, okay? If you get hit with a fuzzball, you, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't feel good. You feel nothing, right? It's trite. It's ineffective. When you're going through the most intense crisis in your life, what are you going to do? Call your pastor and say, give me a fuzzball. <laughs> Throw something fluffy at me. You know, give me a platitude. Listen, a platitude, if you get a bad diagnosis from the doctor or someone in your family uh, passes away suddenly or you lose your job, you don't need a platitude, man. You need something real straight from the heart of God, straight from the Holy Spirit. And any people in your life that will give you that. You know, emotions are wonderful things. How many of you have emotions? Aren't they great? Not always. But listen, God gave us emotions to enrich our lives. Ever watch anybody watching Hallmark movies yet? Yeah, you know, they're predictable to some degree. You know, you see not the most famous people, but semi famous and they're you know, and I'll be watching these things and I know what's gonna happen and even when and even when I know it and it happens I just <laughs> start to what's going on? I'm a dude. I just will be crying. 
<laughs> I know, man. The older I get, the more I cry. I'm 39 years old now, and it just seems like I cry all... Ah. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, although I know you're wondering, how can someone look so young and handsome and virile at the age of 42? It's incredible. Oh, is it growing? Wait till the branches start sprouting, brother, let me tell you. But God gives us these emotions. He wants to enrich our lives with them. And if we ignore them and we don't deal with them properly, they can really harm us. These things were meant for our good can hurt us. In my first church, uh, our, my first church was, shall we say, a little controlling. They had some tendencies that were kind of manipulative, and there was a lot of platitudes. There was a lot of fakeness because of it. You know, you were expected to be a certain way, and if you weren't, people looked down on you. You know, it was that kind of thing. And our pastor in his sermons often belittled emotions as though we weren't supposed to have any and if we showed any we were spiritual bozos and it was that kind of feeling and so we were kind of afraid to acknowledge them for fear and I was very young I was 15 when I started there and we were afraid to acknowledge that we had emotions because we'd get picked on or humiliated you know in front of other people and so and the thought there was like, if you're truly spiritual, you know, your emotions don't matter. You just, you go right to your spirit. You know, I don't know anybody that lives totally out of their spirit. Do you? I mean, we try, you know, but we, we're kind of screw-ups sometimes. I mean, you, you, how many of you know that? We, we mess things up sometimes. Emotions are not there to be eliminated or obliterated. They're there to be subjugated to our spirit. You follow what I'm saying? We want to submit all of our emotions to the Lord, but we're, it's, we're not supposed to not have them. They're part of the whole package, and they enrich not only our lives, but other lives. When I see people like Lee and Goldie, you know, and then Amy, I mean, just seeing you again here in the last few months, my emotions just kick into high gear. I'm like, I'm so glad when I see people like you because I know where your hearts are. I know you're hot for God. I know... You want to make a difference, and you want to disciple and help people. and That just gets my motor going, you know. So I get excited. I get joyful. Sometimes you get sad over things. And if you keep yourself from grieving and you stuff everything in, then what happens to you? You become uh, even worse of a mess. Emotions are to the soul what physical sensations are to the body. If you feel pain in your body... It's a warning sign of something, right? Thank God for pain. I mean, I don't thank God. For, you know, I don't want. To, I don't want any more than I need. But pain will warn you. You know, I remember when we had uh, our fire over here. How many of you know we had a big fire? We lost our previous church building, which enabled. But one of the firemen that was there, he some of the roof fell on him, and he went to the hospital. And they did some x-rays. They found he had cancer in his spine. And if he had not tried with helping saving our church, he'd probably be dead now. Because of that accident, the x-rays, they found it early, and they were able to treat it and save his life. I mean, some amazing things. But see, these are warning signs. Ignoring physical pain can kill you. Emotional pain is also a warning sign of something. It should be paid attention to. Ignoring it, stuffing it, pretending everything's fine when it's not. These things lead to problems down the road. And platitudes will not help cure emotional pain. Okay? Being blessed. That's not going to cure what you're going through if you're struggling with things. Jeff, read Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 through 28. Woe to you, teachers of the law. And Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. 
Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. All right, when it uses the word clean twice uh, in verses 25 and 26, the word in the Greek is katharos. What does that sound like to you? Who said that? Say it louder. Catharsis. Catharsis is a psychological term, but it simply means purging. What the Bible's talking about here is purging, scrubbing, getting a pipe cleaner on the inside of you, very caustic and uh, scrubbing out the inside, getting the gunk out, getting the sin out. However painful it is, it's needed at times. It's good for you. It's good for us. I remember uh, Matthew, my second, this is my oldest son, Michael. I remember Matthew fell. He was always falling. Split his head open. We took him to the hospital. And, and I'm, I'm squeamish, okay? I'm not good in these situations. I can get you there. but So I'm standing there watching him, and they pull his skin up because he cut himself right here. And I could see his skull. That's not the worst. The worst part is when they got the toothbrushy looking thing and started scrubbing his skull. Yeah. But they had to to get the dirt out so there was no infection, okay? They had to do it because he, he fell on the ground just full of dirt. I had to leave the room. My, well, I left the room because my wife said, leave the room. <laughs> and the doctor said, I'm with her, leave the room. And so I just, you know, it was hard to see your child, you know, having that happen to them. What's that? Can't just, you know, big and tough and whatever, you just can't. Yeah, I mean, you love your kids. So you and I, let's just face it, you and I are pretty much a mess. You are a mess. I am a mess. How many of you agree with that? Okay. Uh, knowing that you're all, most of you are worse than me, though, makes me happy to some degree. <laughs> I just get joy out of that just a little bit. No, I'm kidding. But seriously, we are riddled with sin from birth. I mean... Most babies' first words are not, Mommy, Daddy, Mateo notwithstanding. Yeah. Most babies' first words are, Mine, or No, right? There's just, David said there's sin, we have sin from conception. This is part of the curse, the part of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. And the problem here, folks, is that the more we whitewash the, ex you know, the exterior and neglect the interior, we become tombs full of dead men's. We become whitewashed sepulchers. We whitewash our exterior. Why? Because we're afraid that if we're really honest, that people won't like us. And in some cases, we're right. In some cases, we have experiential reasons not to trust everybody quickly. Okay? And we think if we're honest with God, he won't even like us. And so really, I'm, I'm not kidding. You think that's ridiculous. Yeah, it is, but I've been dishonest with God. Have you? I have used platitudes with God, right? Oh, thou fathereth and heaveneth, looketh down on me with gracieth and mirthieth, and I have this terrible lisp. It's a King James lisp, and I can't get rid of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we're phony with God. As if he doesn't know what's really going on inside of us. So we put on this persona. Anybody know what a persona is? It's like a projection of what you want people to think of you. So we put this persona on. And what we think church people will expect or what we think the pastor will expect. I've had so many people come up to me when they first meet me and they just try and say things that I, they think I expect. And I'm like, listen, dude. <laughs> Just, just be yourself, okay? Don't shine me on. I know you're screwed up. I'm screwed up. Don't try and impress me with your whatever, okay? Just be real. Because when we're real with each other, we can help each other. When we're real with God, then something good starts to happen. They that worship him, it says in John 4, must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
The word truth, if you look it up in the Greek, it means reality. God wants spiritual worship, but he also wants the real you. He wants the real you. He doesn't want you to say, oh, God in heaven. You know, he just wants like we did when we clapped at the beginning. We said, Jesus, you're awesome. You're wonderful. You've done so much. You're, you've blessed us. We just bless you. You are, and I use words that, that offend some people, but say, you are cool. There's religious Christians that get offended with that. I don't really care. Jesus is cool. Let me say that again. Jesus is very, very cool. He knows what he's doing. He's excellent. The Bible says of him, he doeth all things well. To me, that's a cool person. We don't watch movies about spies, unless it's a comedy. We don't watch movies about spies that are bunglers. We want to see a guy that really knows his stuff, right, Mike? He can just beat up anybody. Doesn't matter how big or small. He can beat up giants and midgets and horses and sharks and whatever. You know, it's just we love, that's why we watch some of these movies. We love to see somebody really is good at what they're doing. Do it, you know, beyond reality, you know. And so we put on this persona of what we think people expect and we try and be people pleasers. We play roles because we fear the pain of rejection. Ever heard the three R's of rejection? When someone is rejected, it turns into resentment. When someone moves in resentment for quite a while, that turns into rebellion. When you feel a degree, it's rejection, resentment, rebellion. Those are the three R's of rejection. So when someone is rejected, they ruminate over it, they think about it. I was humiliated, I was put down, I was kicked to the curb. I really resent that. I really resent the way I was treated. And you ruminate, you, you dwell on it. You think, and then all of a sudden that resentment becomes more of a, than a feeling and it comes outward in rebellion. Those are the three R's of rejection. Rejection is a serious thing. Look at Psalm 39, 1 through 3. Jeff, would you read that, please? I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. But when I was silent and still, not even saying anything good, my anguish increased. Increased. His anguish increased. Go ahead. My heart grew hot within me, and as I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. You know, David had good intentions. He says here, I wanted to keep my tongue from sinning. But the longer he suppressed his anguish, the more intense his agony became. He couldn't think of anything else. So he ruminated on it until he was burning up on the inside. And he, he needed to let it out somehow. Suppressing your true feelings is not good for you. And it's contrary to what, it's contrary to what you might think. It does no good for your relationship with God either. Being a phony with God is probably the, the worst thing you can do. He knows what you're feeling anyway. He knows you hate that guy's guts and you want to choke him. So, but, oh, Lord, I just for No, you don't forgive him. You, you're mad at him. Just tell the Lord that. And God will help you to stop hating his guts. And God will help you to forgive him. But when you try and do these things by the grit of your teeth, you usually fail. Better let it out to the Lord. Bottled emotions actually disrupt your relationship with your father. I just say one other thing here. God is not afraid of truth, whatever it may be. God is not going to be mad at you because you tell him how you're feeling when it's, 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 you're in a negative place. Okay? I think God gets more offended when we, we try and fake him out. It's not like you have this lead-lined box back here somewhere where God can't see your thoughts. You know, God's not Superman like we can't see through lead anyway, but you know what I'm saying? We think that we can, you know, you can't hide anything from him. God loves truth. Jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth will, will set you free. Now, most people think, well, that's just related to the gospel. No, that, there's a principle there too. That all truth brings liberty and freedom to people. It's when people hide and stuff and pretend and fake, put on personas. That's when anguish starts like David was feeling in this scripture. 
God's not afraid of it. Don't you be afraid to bring it to God. Because God's not... Listen, God isn't on Prozac, okay? God doesn't hear our thoughts and then, you know, he turns to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Can you believe what that guy's thinking? What, what do you do with that? You know, God is not like that at all. God, I have found that God is a very secure person. And so is Jesus. And so is the Holy Spirit. Read Psalm 109. Now you're going to see uh, David here. And you're going to see him really let it out to God. Go ahead. Read it with passion, Jeff. Oh, God, whom I praise and do not remain silent, for wicked and deceitful men have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues. With words of hatred, they surround me. They attack me without cause. In return for my friendship, they accuse me. But I am a man of prayer. They repay me evil for good and hatred for my friendship. Appoint an evil man to oppose him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him be found guilty. And may his prayers condemn him. David's really mad here. Brian. Are you catching that? He's not quite done with his tirade. Go ahead. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Wow, dude. Dude, now he, he does need a Prozac or something. I don't know what he needs. But that's, wow, and he keeps going. Yeah, don't get David mad at you. Yeah, go ahead, Jeffy. May his children be wandering beggars. Oh, wow. May they be driven from their ruined homes. May a, cre may a creditor seize all he has may strangers plunder the fruits of his labor may no one extend kindness to him or take pity on his fatherless children may his descendants be cut off their names blotted out from the next generation may the intent may the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the lord may the sin of his mother never be blotted out may their sins always remain before the lord that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth gee imagine what he would say if he really didn't like the guy <laughs> that's rough stuff and but who's david talking to here see god knew what he's feeling anyway david's intense honesty with god i mean i i love that People had heard him. He was ticked off. You have to understand something here. Listen carefully to this. David was not doing anything evil here. He's telling this guy, I hate his guts. I hope he falls into ruination and his kids too. And his little dog too. <laughs> right? I mean, you know. When somebody really, really hurts you, really hurts you and you just pretend to just all wrap it up uh, you know I'm, I'm sorry I don't know anybody that really doesn't want to react when someone really betrays you I mean really and I've had that done to me a number of times you want to react and what David was doing was venting his true emotions in the safest place possible the only place he was sure he'd not be judged or criticized or made to feel stupid or inferior because a lot of Christians can't be real with each other, can't be real with their preachers, because they're made to feel stupid. Oh, brother, where's your faith? Let me, let me, I'll show you my faith. Get a little closer here. <laughs> he was getting the venom out of his system, the poison. He's doing it with his Father in heaven, not apart from him. See, a lot of us, we get hurt. We're like a wounded dog. We go hide under the porch and... You know, we don't want God to see us while we just say, oh, I hate that guy, you know. The one who truly understood his heart was God. In fact, what did God call David? A man after my own heart. I think one of the reasons perhaps that God called David that was because God loves truth and David was really honest, painfully honest. And I want to tell you something this morning. There's nothing you can ever say to God 
that will surprise him or shock him or make him hate you or make him forsake you or think less of you. He's going to love you. He'll love you no matter what you do. But it's for your it's in your best interest if you hear this word today and get rid of all the phoniness and all the personas and all the expectations and all the people pleasing. It doesn't mean you have to be rude. Just well look at this verse. Go ahead, Jeff. Ephesians chapter four. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. How many of you have ever thought in your Christian life that anger is always sin? It's always sinful to have anger. Yeah, I have. It really helped me when I read the scripture that you can be angry and not sin. The Bible doesn't tell you to do stuff that you can't do. Be angry and sin not. There is a righteous anger. It's what we do sometimes when we get angry that causes sin. Not necessarily even the anger itself. But again, not all anger is sin. What does God want us to do with our negative emotions? Read from 1 Peter 5. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, this is something people say, well, how do you do that, Pastor Mike? I do it verbally. I just say, Lord, I'm hurting or I'm angry or I can't bear this load. I need to cast it on you. Lord, I, I, I know you're, you have big shoulders, so I'm dumping this on you because I can't handle it. Now, when you do that at first, you don't always feel the, the, the thing lift. Just give it a few moments. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. Because a lot of things God does are invisible. They're mystical. You can't always see them, but they work. It works. And so somebody comes along, I don't know if it's the Holy Spirit or Jesus or an angel or whatever, he just starts to lift that off of your shoulders and you, you feel a peace again and a freedom and even a measure of forgiveness. And then you make the choice to forgive. Forgiveness is a choice. Here, uh, let me, can I help you with forgiveness for a minute? Oh, I guess not. I mean, can I help you with forgiveness? Uh, anybody, nobody in here has trouble with forgiveness, right? I mean, at all. Let me tell you something about forgiveness. A lot of people, they make a choice to forgive, and then they get anger or other emotions that are involuntary, and then they say, oh, I didn't forgive. I'm terrible. Now, let me tell you something. Some emotions are involuntary. Have you ever heard of PTSD? I know some of you have. Some of you in here actually have that. You know, Ralph, you're a Vietnam veteran. You saw horrible things, okay? I have, you, I'm sure you have PTSD at times, right? Yeah. Ralph is a war hero, in my opinion. He's in the Vietnam War, and he was captured and tortured and all kind of stuff. And, I mean, we thank God for you, for your service, and, and all of our veterans. We're so grateful. I've been through stuff. I'll, I'll have flashbacks of stuff. Anybody else in here, let's be honest, you have flashbacks, yeah. And they're hard. They're difficult. You're, all of a, you hear somebody say something, you hear a song or something, puts you right in that moment when you were victimized. And it's painful. And so what do you what do? You, do? You, st and you feel anger. Boy, that guy really hurt me, really betrayed me. Oh, but I forgave him. So why am I feeling this anger? Let me just tell you something. Emotions are involuntary. It does, if you feel a, an involuntary emotion, it does not it does not ruin the forgiveness that you chose to give. It's just something that you have to just go through and you say, Lord, I still choose to forgive that person even though right now I'd like to strangle them. Just be honest with God, but I've made a choice to forgive. It's just like the choice of salvation. Uh, when, how, I mean, when did you get saved, brother? Give me your name. Is it Jeremy or... Jeremy, when you got saved, you meant it, right? But have you felt really saved every single day since then? No, me either. Sometimes I wake up and I look at the mirror and I go, man, you are ugly. <laughs> you know? And I wake up in a bad mood for no reason at all, like, Rrr, you know, just kind of grumbly. And Well, just because I'm not, I don't feel saved, does that mean I didn't make the choice to receive Christ? 
It's the same with your uh, with forgiveness. If you made a choice to forgive, don't let emotions lie to you and tell you you haven't forgiven. What happened is hurt. You're experiencing a flashback. You just walk. You know, for me, I'll just be walking through the house during the day, and all of a sudden, wham! I'll just get a flashback of what that guy did to me. I go, wow, wow, that, wow. And then after a while will pass, but see, I understand something that that's involuntary. It's going to last until it's over. But I stand on the choice of forgiveness that I made, and I still forgave that person. How many of you, this is like a little side journey here, but how many of you have ever read the scripture where Peter says, how many times do we forgive a brother if he offends us? Do we forgive him seven times? What did Jesus say? How much is 70 times 7? And did Jesus mean we stop at 490? What was he really saying? Yes. Now, when you first read that scripture, like I did, I thought, well, if he offends me, and I, I forgave him, and then he offends me again, I forgive him again, then he offends me in a different way, I forgive Well, listen, that also can apply to the same sin. You may have to forgive that person 490 times for that same offense. When I when I get those flashbacks, what I do is I just re I restate, okay, Lord, I chose to forgive him, and I I do I forgive him, and so you see that 490 times can apply to the same person, the same sin over and over again, not just different sins from from someone. I don't know if that helps. Does that help anybody at all? Yeah, you're not a total scumbag because you feel some anger at times over something somebody did to you that was really bad. You just stand on your choice to forgive and you allow the emotions to run. And they, and they do run their course, don't they? You give them to the Lord, you cast that care upon him, and then you're in a place of peace again and forgiveness. If we learn how to acknowledge our junk, our garbage, we no longer have to live in denial. Denial is unhealthy and it's dishonest. Stop, stop it. Just say, yeah. Yeah, just read Jeremiah. Would you, Jeff, read that scripture? 614. My people are broken, shattered, and they put on band-aids saying, it's not so bad. You'll be just fine. But things are not just fine. Yeah. If you're fine, great. But if you're not fine, it's okay to not to say, well, I'm really not doing that great today. You know, most Christians, they get coached again by people like me. How you doing today, brother? Fine, 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 fine. <laughs> Praise the Lord, brother. Fine, 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 fine. I just want to blow their circuits and go, you know, like, fine, 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 boom, you know. It's robotic. You're lying. You're lying. You're a lying. Stop lying. It's not Christian to lie. <laughs> we should have learned that by now, right? It's not a Christian thing to do to lie. <laughs> when I'm depressed or angry or frustrated and I try and come to God with fake religious platitudes, I get it's like the Rolling Stones. I can't get no satisfaction. I get no satisfaction. And God's not happy with it either. He's not happy because he knows that that I don't trust him enough, that we don't trust him enough to tell him what he already knows going on inside of us. He knows. How many of your parents? Raise your hand if you have kids. Yeah. Have you ever said to your son, your kid, son, I want to help, but I can't help you until you, unless you tell me what's really going on. Right? God wants us to tell him what's really, what's going on. What's going on? What is this music thing all of a sudden? When, you, when you're emotionally stressed, God doesn't expect your prayers to be really noble, okay? Oh, God, I know people have... It. No, he doesn't want to hear that. He just wants you to trust him and say what you really feel, no matter how ugly it may sound. Get it out. Purge, man. Vents. Don't be a Pharisee. Otherwise... It's going to fester, and it's eventually going to come out in a more destructive way. And you're going to hurt somebody. You're like a loaded gun. You're going to go off on somebody at some point. You know what my favorite prayer is? How many of you know what my favorite prayer is? Yeah, it's, you, you, did you hear somebody say it? Here's my favorite prayer. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. 
I'm in trouble. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Sometimes you don't have time to think up a real noble one, you know? What did Peter, you remember Peter saw Jesus, looking at Jesus. He walks out in the water like Jesus did. And then what did he do? The dumb dumb, he starts looking at the storm instead of looking at the Lord. We do that, don't we? We always start to sink when we do that too, don't we? And what was Peter's prayer when he was sinking? Oh, God, Father Almighty. I mean, no, he didn't have time for that. It would be, oh, God, you know. How many of you know what Peter's two-word prayer was? What was it? Lord, save! He didn't even have time for the me. Lord, save! You know, No, Lord, save! That's it! He's going down. And the Lord did. He saved him. Amen? Uh, read this other scripture, Jeff. We're coming to the home stretch here. Mark 2.17 When Jesus heard this, he told them, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. One of the, the most difficult things, and the, the thing, one of the things I like the least in dealing with is people that have a religious spirit. They sound real pious. That is the worst demons. Those are the worst demons I encounter. 32 years of ministry... I've traveled all over the world. I want to tell you, the worst demons I've encountered are the religious ones because they make everything sound pious. Yeah. Oh, Lord Jesus. Spirituality is not about being perfect. Aren't you glad? Say it with me. Spirituality is not about being perfect that's releasing to me i try to be perfect i really do and i know that most of you do too i know you try and please the lord i know that you hate sin i know that you know that god hates sin god doesn't hate the sinner neither did the how can i hate a sinner i am one how can i stand in judgment over someone else but I can instruct, I can encourage, I can rebuke, I can do all those things because the Lord gives me authority. But it's not about being perfect. That's a lie that's told in churches all over the world. A truly spiritual person is one who radically acknowledges their imperfections and understands something. We are all fellow strugglers on this journey, aren't we? I struggle. If you're perfect, then you should be up here teaching me. But then I'd have to have an altar call for liars if you said you're perfect. <laughs> As fellow strugglers, we just need to learn how to lean on God and lean on each other. i tell you, something that I really like about our church is this church is not a place where you have to be fake in order to be accepted. You're allowed to be human in this church. You're allowed to make mistakes if you have a problem, you don't need to hide it. You don't need to be a fake. You don't need to say all those platitudes. I'm being blessed. Praise the Lord, brother. And not when you're miserable. Just tell us you're miserable. And we'll pray for you. We'll stand with you. We'll, we'll, hug, this, this, we'll hug the negativity out of you, if nothing else. Last scripture I have is James 5. Confess to one another, therefore, your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins. And pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. Yeah, that's what church is supposed to be, isn't it? Isn't it? Am I wrong? I mean, it wasn't my thought. It's the Bible, right? This altar here, this altar is open to imperfect people who need God's love and need him to heal their wounded hearts. This altar is open to people who have sinned and fallen short and made mistakes and even backslidden and walked away from God. This altar is open to you. If you're watching now on live stream, I want to tell you, Jesus loved the backsliders and the sinners, he hung out with the, the worst kind of people. He loved them. 
I feel like there's at least one person watching right now on live stream that you are a prodigal son, so to speak. You're somebody that you were walking with God and you walked away from the Lord. Maybe it was a church hurt. Whatever it is that discouraged you, I just want to say whatever people did to you, Jesus is not like that. He's just waiting for you. And the moment he sees you moving back toward him, he's going to get the robe and the ring and put all that stuff on you. He's going to cook the fatted calf and have a big feast welcoming you home because God is a loving father. The Prado got out there. He was eating gruel. He was eating the worst stuff that pigs ate. That's talking about someone who returns to sin. It's like a dog eating his vomit. I want to encourage you that God made you for more than that. There's people watching. There's people probably in this room. You think you're a horrible, no good person. You think that you are a scumbag. You know, Paul writes, such were some of you. Such were some of you. When you keep calling yourself a scumbag, and I see preachers doing this all the time too. They're always talking about how sinful you are and how rotten you are and how, you know, we need to hear some of that, but listen, I read the, as I read the, the epistles, that's not the way the conversation goes. The apostles are always speaking to the potential of the people in front of them as well. God made you for something better than that. God did not create you to go back and eat that vomit and return to that sinful way of life. You're not a piece of garbage. You're not a, a pile of dung. Let me tell you something about God. God don't make no junk. There's a higher calling for you. You were made for more. than this. Some of the people, you know, you're on Facebook and I see and I, I feel so bad for you because you're wandering. You don't ha know who you are in Christ. You have no identity. I just saw a new Facebook friend. I don't even know where this young girl came. She was 20. And she was posting, I don't even know this person. I don't even know how I became friends with her. She's like, I need somebody to buy me some booze. I want to get drunk. She posted it three times. There's no one responding. <laughs> She's 20 years old, man. She can't buy booze on her own, right? She's really not supposed to drink, is she? She's under 21, right? I saw another young lady. She was in our church years ago. She was a foster kid. She said something to the effect of, I need some sex tonight. I'll take almost anybody, she said. Breaks my heart. If you're watching out there, I want to just tell you how much Jesus loves you. And rest assured, even though God loves you just the way you are, and he does, he also loves you too much to leave you just the way you are. We can sing just as I am when we come to him. We have to realize the trans when we come to him, the transformation process starts. It starts with the word, reading the word, hearing it preached. Right, Natalie? It starts with prayer, talking, and talking to him and building a relationship with him that's not based on phoniness. God was friends with Abraham. Jesus wants to be your friend. It starts with communing with the Holy Spirit, understanding his constant presence with you, acknowledging that. Communing is talking. It's fellowshipping. It's a total relational involvement with God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. He's not going to just leave you the way you are. He's not going to leave you struggling in your sins you know, like a baby that's just been left in the afterbirth. He's not going to do that. He takes you. He cleans you up. He starts to feed you. Now, you do have to go to church. You get some big, massive feedings and a lot of encouragement when you go to church. Amen? What's my favorite three words lately? Say it slowly now. Go. Slow, slower than that. Go to church. If you're watching out there, if you're sick or you can't make for whatever reason or you're, you know, what's the word when uh, if an older person can't get out or shut in or, you know, that kind of thing, handicapped and you can't get out. 
God bless you. You just come and enjoy. You can come and enjoy anyway, but I want to encourage you to get off of your blessed assurance if you're healthy <laughs> and find a great fellowship of believers. I want to tell you something. If you're in this area, this is, a, this is not just a good. I've pastored really for 32 years. I am 60 years old, in case you're wondering. I know I don't look it. I know you're shocked. Take, let, take a moment. <laughs> let it settle in. He's so handsome and virile. How can he be 60? I'm young-minded. But listen, this is a great fellowship. This is, in 32 years, this is the best church, the best group of people I've ever pastored. This is the finest group of people in the whole Summit County area, in my opinion. Amen. You're not going to do better than this. Yeah, go ahead and clap. It's all God's mercy. I warn you, they are so friendly, they will hug the stuffing out of you, but you're going to start to like it after the first few hugs. It takes a couple of hugs to get used to, but then it's like a drug. <laughs> it's just sort of like, oh, I like this. Huggy, 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 you know. And they're glad to see it's like cheers. You walk in and they say, Trey! It's like they used to say Norm if you ever watch the show. Cheer. Trey! And there's a lot of drinking that goes on here. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Dude scared me. <laughs> but we drink the new wine of the Holy Spirit here. We don't drink booze. We don't need that. We just, we love the Lord. Now, uh, I want to ask this morning and uh, people that are watching, uh, all also by delay, because this will be showing forever on the internet, but does everybody here know Jesus personally and definitely as their Lord and Savior? Because if you don't, this is your moment. It's not complex. You don't have to jump through a lot of hoops. It's very simple. It's just You say a little sinner's prayer, and it's a beginning with God. It's just a fresh start today. So anybody here that you're not totally certain, here's the big question, and this you have to be truthful. God forbid, if your life were to end in the next five minutes, are you sure beyond any shadow of a doubt that you would be with God forever? Because if you, if you can't answer that question, yes, Pastor Mike, I am certain that I would go right to be with Jesus forever, you're probably not saved yet. You may be close. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is at hand. That means that it's as close to you as your hand. It's this close to you. You know, a lot of people miss heaven by 12 inches, the difference between the head and the heart. There's a lot of people that believe that God exists. But the Bible says even the devils believe and they tremble. They tremble because they're not saved. They, they tremble because they know their future. If you believe that God exists, that's good, but you're only up to the level of a devil. That gets you to devil le level. All right? You want to go above that and get to Christian level, which is just asking Jesus to come into your heart and save you. It's really that simple. So anybody here, just bow your head for a moment if you would. If there's anybody here right now, I feel like the Holy Spirit's with and you are not 100% certain, just slip your hand up and let me see it because we're going to just pray in a moment. God bless you, sir. Amen. Who else in here? You say, Pastor Mike, I'm not 100% certain. I don't know if I'm saved. Because if you don't know, you probably aren't. But it's a simple, don't procrastinate God. No, just turn that off. Don't procrastinate with God. Don't He knows where you're at. Anybody, I, I feel like there's at least one or two more, but it's your choice. If you're not sure that you're born again, that you know Jesus, you're not sure if your life ended, you'd be with him forever, just raise your hand right now and join this gentleman. God bless you, sweetheart. I saw that hand. Thank you, sweetie. Is there anybody else? I feel like there's one more. Please don't fight with God. Just run up the white flag and say, Jesus, I'm yours. I want to get saved. I want to be born again. I want a fresh start. Who is that one more? I feel like there's one more person. Can't force you. You don't know for sure. You can in just a few moments. Raise your hand if that applies to you. I'm going to ask the two, if, you would, if you'd be kind enough, if you wouldn't mind, Give me the privilege of leading you to Christ. Would you just come up here in front of the pulpit? Yeah, God bless you, buddy. Sweetheart, come on up here. 
Emily? Yeah, you raised your hand, Donna. Come on up, sweetie. I feel like there's one more. Please don't let this moment slip by. Who is that? There's also, I know there's folks watching right now on Facebook, possibly on YouTube. This is your moment as well. You don't have to be in a church to get saved. I wasn't. I was in a kitchen. Isn't that right, Cindy? You were in a basement, weren't you? My wife and I didn't get saved in church. You don't have to be in a church to get saved. But you do have to invite Jesus in. All right, let's pray. I'm going to ask everybody to join in. And this is wonderful because we're seeing two people give their lives and their future completely to God. I'm so proud of you, Laban. So proud of you. Emily, I'm proud of you. It takes guts to raise your hand. It takes guts to stand up in front of people. But everyone here is for you. They're praying for you. Let's bow our heads. I'm going to lead you in the sinner's prayer. Would you all just also pray with them? Father God, I thank you that you gave your son to die on the cross to pay for my sins. Lord Jesus, I believe in you that you rose from the dead and that you're seated at the right hand of the Father. Right now, Lord, the best way that I know how I open my heart and I say, come in. I give you my life, my future, my destiny. I call you Savior and I call you Master. You're my Lord. You're the boss now. And I promise, Lord, I'll read your word and I'll talk to you in prayer. And I'll go to church consistently. And I ask you to use me to touch other lives for your glory's sake. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. I am now a Christian, and I'm proud of it. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody says... Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Amen. Wow. God bless you, Laban. God bless you, Emily. Sue right here has just uh, some literature. It's full of scripture. Yeah, it's what to do next. Now that I'm a Christian, what do I do? I feel like I want to pray for people just momentarily now that you heard the message today. Abby? that you heard the message today and you want you want to say to the Lord, Lord, I want to be more honest with you. I need some purging in my life. I, I want you to give me faith to just talk to you in reality and to confess my sins and faults to mature Christians that I can trust. If that's you, just raise your hand. In fact, just want you to stand up because I'm going to pray for you. If that's you. Say, Lord, I just I want to be more honest with you, with others. I want to be able to vent and purge to you and to the right individuals. I don't want to just keep stuffing all this. I don't want to be phony. I want to be real. Let's pray. Father, I just pray for these ones that are standing right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I know that a lot of them have been coached. Lord, I ask you to unplay all the old tapes that are playing in them. Get rid of all the old messages. Telling them, oh, you got to say this, you got to act like that. You got to please the preacher or the other, you know. Just, Lord, right now I just totally disable that stuff. I ask you to wash their brains of all that stuff. And just allow them the freedom to be real. With what they're going through, what what they're feeling. Especially with you, Lord, especially with you. I ask you to bless them and touch them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now hang on a second here. There's um, Wow. Yeah, somebody in here, you've been having some irregular 
uh, heart rhythms. You're concerned about that. Who is that? Is that you? Come on up here, sweetheart. I think the Lord's going to touch you. We're going to pray for people in a moment. I think the Lord's fixing to do some healing today. Uh, someone's having been having like some headaches in the right side of your brain. They, they hurt pretty good. And uh, who is that? I feel like the Lord wants to touch you. He's having headaches and it's like worse than the right side. Who is that? If that's you, raise your hand. Come on, you can't get healed if you're not willing to acknowledge these things. Who's been having those headaches? The Lord wants to touch you. There's also someone that ha you've had persistent like sinus infections. And it's really, is that you? Are you the sinus infections? Yeah, come on up here. I'm still getting the thing about headaches, but you can't make, I've been doing this for over 30 years, folks. I know you're there. You just, you know, you just got to break that thing of embarrassment. Oh, you know, you don't get the goodies. You don't get the blessings. Okay. Is that you, Missy, or are you up here to stand with her? Okay. Then there's, um, I don't know if it's carpal tunnel or something, but what, something looks like pain in your hands. Uh, is that you, Kathy? Anybody else have that? Come on up, Kathy, if you can. Is that you, too? All right. Are you the headache as well? Okay. Yeah, they're pretty bad, you said? All right, we need to stop that. By the Lord's grace, by the Lord's virtue. Um, if you're new to this, this is the gifts of the Spirit. There's something called word of knowledge. There's also gifts of healings. Go ahead. The Holy Spirit speaking to me. All of you are being plagued by nightmares and dreams that are agitating you to death. Slip your hands up to where it's interfering with things. You're struggling in that arena, reoccurring. Uh, it, it's making you wake up agitated. And the devil's plaguing you is what's going on. It's not from the Lord. If you're having a problem with that, come on up here and let Pastor Mike pray over you, please. Amen. This is what the Bible calls word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is just one of the gifts of the Spirit. It, the Lord, the Holy Spirit shows you things you would not know ordinarily. And it's always for a purpose. And then when you pray, sometimes gifts of healings are manifest, which is another one of the gifts of the Spirit. People, when they think of gifts of the Spirit, they get all, it's all about, they have arguments about tongues and interpretation. There's seven other gifts that are higher than this. Not that those are not good, but, and a lot of people don't pay attention to those. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Well, just stop beating yourself up and just. 490 times, just keep every time the feelings come up, you reiterate that, that you chose, you made a choice to forgive. All right. Hang on just one second. I want to make sure. Hearing from the Holy Spirit is like, um, you have to get really quiet on the inside and listen for that still small voice. In life, there's always so much noise that sometimes we don't get really still and just say, God, what are you saying or what do you want to do here? And God wants to do some good things. Okay. Stretch your hands towards these ones and just understand that Jesus, when he healed people, 
virtue. He even said, I felt virtue flow out of me. We need his healing virtue. He's the healer. Lord, right now I just speak over every one of these individuals at their point of need. And I say, Lord God, with the virtue, the healing virtue, the healing power of Jesus Christ, let it flow into them right now, into their minds, into their hearts, into their emotions, into their physical bodies. I ask you to heal them and give them relief from those things that are ailing them. Whether spiritual, emotional, or physical, right now I proclaim healing. And I say to each one of these individuals, be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed. I'm going to ask the congregation, just say those simple words. Say, be healed in Jesus' name. That's how simple it is. We proclaim. There's a prayer of proclamation. There's commanding prayer. All prayer is an asking. We just, because God, Jesus is the same yesterday, and today, and forever. He still heals. So we call you healed. I call you healed, not by my authority, but by the authority given to us by Jesus Christ. I call you healed. No more pain, no more nightmares, no more fear. No more pain in the head or the hands or anywhere else. I, in Jesus' name, Father, now that heartbeat, I just ask you to steady it. Cause that heart to beat normally just the way you created it. Just the way that you were created, sweetheart. In the name of Jesus, heart, be healed. Come into line with creative order of how God made you. Yeah. Blood pressure decrease. Blood, pre blood sugar normalize and stabilize. Everybody. In the name of Jesus Christ. If you have any kind of ailment right now, let's just put your hand over your heart. Or if it's like a physical pain that you can reach, like a shoulder, a knee or something, go ahead and touch that. And I just, in, in Jesus' name, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. When he walked the earth, he healed people. He still does it today. I call each one of you healed, healed, healed. If you're suffering in your emotions, your heart, if you have PTSD, if you have those, some of those issues, right now, I just say, be healed, be healed in Jesus' name. And take the authority given you by Christ. And you command. If the devil starts to tempt you, you need deliverance, you command him to leave you alone in Jesus' name. You can do that. God gave you the authority to do that. He also gave us the authority to forgive sins. So in Jesus' name, if, you're, if you feel like you've just sinned to, against the Lord this week, I call you forgiven. You need to confess it to the Lord and ask him for forgiveness. But then like the woman that was found in adultery, go and sin no more. Get that, whatever that temptation is, get it out of your life, out of your house. If it's a physical thing, get it out. It's not worth it, amen? Amen. All right, God bless you. Um, you can be seated. Uh, just give me one more minute. I want to make sure that we're done. Mike, have I met you before? Yeah, I don't remember. It's probably been a long time, but I, th I think I have a word for you. Is that okay? Yeah, would you stand for a moment? You know, the Lord's been after you, and he's trying to put his fire in you and on you. And uh, you're a thinking person, you're a logical person, which is wonderful. Uh, that's correct, isn't it? And yet sometimes the, the spiritual aspects, the supernatural aspects of God are challenging for you because you're very much oriented up in the, the logic area. And uh, the Lord says, that's good. He made you that way. He uses people. He uses logic and intelligence, and he wants you to know that there's nothing wrong with that. But there are times the Holy Spirit is saying that you need to let go. And you need to trust your instincts. You need to trust what the Holy Spirit is saying to you, not here, but here. 
And I know you feel those things. The Lord's telling me you feel those things here sometimes. You feel leadings and like the Lord's speaking to you and he wants you to do something that sometimes makes no sense to the logical mind. And God is saying, trust me, I'm your father. Like the word says, you're, if you ask for a fish, you're not going to get a, is, that, is it a stone? Yeah. If you ask for a loaf of bread, you're not going to get, what's the other thing? A snake. You know, the, when we ask God for good things, he gives us good things. Okay. Ask the Lord to, to show you and try and be more obedient to that. Be open to that. And he'll take you by the hand. He'll teach you how to walk in the spirit, not just in the mind. Okay. All right. Does that make sense to you, brother? Yeah. The Holy Spirit knows you. I don't know a thing about you, but he knows everything. Um, I'm feeling something over in this section here. Um, yeah, what's your name, dear? You're wearing a jacket, blonde hair, young. Yeah, what's your name, sweetie? That's right. And I met you last week, did I? Or, or no? Was she not here last week? When? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> Come on, I'm 60. Give me a break here. Uh, may I speak a word over you, sweetheart? How old are you again? 13. Would you stand up, please? Uh, Jasmine, you're, you're young, but the Lord wants you to remember this. You have a calling on your life. I felt it in my office last week. I feel it now. Your feet are not always going to be every moment of your life on American soil. I feel like God is going to take you places, uh, short-term mission trips, uh, do you have a heart for that by any chance? Have you thought about going places? I mean, because that's, that was a question, dear. You have? Well, God just wants me to confirm it that, yeah, that is in your future. Start thinking about it. Start praying about it. You're still a little ways off. But there's going to come opportunities, okay? There are mis short-term mission trips for teenagers, Okay, we used to do one to Mexico every year, you know, and uh, start praying and looking for opportunities and uh, w with your, your parents or your guardians, make sure they feel comfortable with it. But if an opportunity comes and you feel like a green light in your spirit, go, because the Lord's going to meet you in that place. You're going to see amazing things when you go there. It's funny, like God, sometimes he needs to take people completely out of their normal realm, out of their comfort zone and like even distance, like far away. And then when they get to that place out of obedience, he meets them there. Like, uh, was it Naaman the leper? Remember Naaman, Cindy? And, and uh, you know, God said, and he had leprosy. And God sent him to see the prophet. And the prophet, uh, which, which prophet was it, dear? Elisha. Elisha said, go in the Jordan River and dip seven times in the river and you'll be healed. And then the guy was just stupid enough. He's like, I don't want to dip in that just dirty Jewish waters. He was, he was prejudiced. He was bigoted. And thank God he had a good servant because the servant said, Master, if it was some really hard thing, you'd have done it. But all you got to do is go down the river and just, bloop, bloop, you know, seven times. And, and he, so he talked sense into Naaman and Naaman went and he got healed. The point is that God will take you far away to a place where there's no distraction and all out of your normal thing. And then he speaks to you. When you get to that first place, he's going to speak more to you about your destiny. But in the meantime, I want you to hold fast, you know, ponder these things in your heart. Just like Mary did when they said, you're going to give birth to the Savior. God is going to birth something in you, Jasmine. Okay? It's there. I know, this, I know the goods when I see the goods. And as, as soon as you walked in that room, I could feel this person is going to be used by God. She's not just any run-of-the-mill person. She's special. You've always known you were special, haven't you? You've always had this awareness of God. And Is your mom here with you? Yeah. Is she special? Very. Yeah, so I'm not in the, you know, off on some weird tangent here. Have you felt, Mom, that, sh that God has something for her? Everybody knows her does. Yeah, you just you have it, sweetheart. Don't ever run from it. Don't let anything, don't let some boy or some goofy friend or... Yeah, don't let any of this, yeah. 
Don't let them pull you away. And don't ever have a boyfriend that won't go to church with you, okay? That's the smartest thing anybody can do. You want to really test a guy whether he really cares about you, invite him to church. If he doesn't want to go, he doesn't care about you. He wants something else, all right? You stay away from the something else wanters, okay? <laughs> Trust me on that. Amen, Mom? Amen. Amen. Yeah, let them meet me. I'll smack them around. Don't you worry. I don't know. I will. <laughs> okay, you can be seated. God, I hope that was a blessing to you, dear. Yeah, boy, God is just good. God's good. Yeah. Yeah, Jeremy, I can't get away from it. Would you stand, please? You you knew it was going to happen to you, didn't you? I yeah. Well, it's happening. Uh, okay, so you are not what they said you were. You're not at all what people have said you were. You're different. You are a fighter. You are, you are not a loser. You are a winner, okay? God wants you to know that because God's a winner. God doesn't lose, and you're his son. Am I correct about that? You're his child? Then you are a winner, Okay. You're, and, you're, and you're a fighter. You're not somebody who gives up easily. And the Lord says, don't give up. Don't give up on anything you believe in. The Lord says, I'm going to refine you. Right now, in the spirit, Jeremy, I see you like you're a sawed-off shotgun. You can do a lot of damage, but you can also create friendly fire. You know what friendly fire is? Some of the good people get <laughs> injured as well. Because a sawed-off shotgun, it just kind of blasts in a bunch of different directions. Uh, the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to refine you. I'm going to turn you into a laser beam. Now, laser beams are much more effective. You can even do the most delicate surgery with a laser beam, correct? God is, you have to have a willingness now to let the Holy Spirit begin to refine you. Refocus your thoughts. You've come out of some different things, okay? Don't keep dwelling on them so much that you can't see the new thing that God is setting right in front of you. Because God has a path for you. He has a purpose for you. And you're a unique person. You're the kind of person that you don't mind going in where there's smoke and fire and rubble and cleaning things up and doing what, saying what needs to be said and doing what needs to be done, okay? But here's the battle for you. From this day forward, the Father wants you to see yourself that way. Because if you don't see yourself that way, it's never going to happen. He wants you to also see that his favor is on you, Jeremy. His favor is on you. And God is going to do good to you. He's going to do good for you. And he's going to use you to do good. And in so doing, you're going to be fulfilled. You're going to find great fulfillment and joy. Because you're going to impact lives in ways that you never thought. Don't be afraid of small beginnings. Because we're starting small. But it, just watch how quickly. If you'll just say, God, okay. Use me. God, okay. I want to, I want to, see the, I want to move into the future with you. God, okay. I'm willing for you to refine me. Watch what he does. He, and this isn't, this isn't me now. He'll start to open doors for you. Somebody will come to you with a problem. And all of a sudden you'll see you'll have wisdom for them. You'll see a situation where you can help. Because I see, like, when I look at you, I see strong hands in the spirit. You, you have strong hands and you can give aid to people. You can give help to people. Do it. When those doors open, you walk through them. God has a great plan for you, my friend. And you're going to do amazing things okay just be willing just that's all the lord asks be willing realize who he is to you realize who he wants you to be and then start to let it happen and boy it's going to happen and when things ha when god starts doing things they happen fast okay amen does that minister to you does that help you at all good when you give prophetic words by the way for those you don't know even though it's for a specific person, there's other people hearing it that like, oh, that applies to me. If that applies to you, take it for yourself as well. Because it's the, the Holy Spirit. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When prophecy happens, there's a this spiritual thing that happens, and it touches all the hearers that are in the room. Amen? It's a good thing. What's your name, dear? You're sitting next to Trey again. What's your name? You have a name, right? You're you're not dumb, right? I mean, not, you can you can speak, right? What's your name, sweetie? Destiny. Destiny. What's that? Oh, 
Yeah, speak up, honey. I'm hard of hearing in one ear, and <coughs> the other one should be cut off. <laughs> Dusty, would you stand, please? You know Jesus as your Savior? Good. You love the Lord with all your heart? Okay. I see you with a hammer and a chisel. I don't know what that means. Are you an artistic type person? You are. Okay. And God says you're going to create things for me. God's put in you a creative faculty. And I've never met you, right? I had no way of knowing you're artistic. Uh, but the Holy Spirit knows you better than you know yourself sometimes. And he wants you to begin to seek the Lord on how to use your art. What are you artistic in? Painting? I think you're going to paint for the Lord. In fact, there are some churches during praise and worship, and if you ever want to do that there, they'll have an easel, they'll have a canvas, they'll have paints. While worship is happening, people will just creatively paint whatever the Holy Spirit puts on their heart to paint. What's that, dear? I, singing. You also sing? Are you on a worship team somewhere? Are you a good singer? Yeah? Well, you should audition somewhere, I mean. Yeah. If that would require actually singing to someone who can hear you. <laughs> and how old are you, dear? 23, yeah. Well, the, you, you, you're going to have to work through some of the shyness stuff because, you know, God wants stuff from you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be standing up right now. God's, God wants you to move forward. That's really the whole purpose of church services, isn't it? Anyway, to help people move forward in their walk with God and their service to Christ. The choice is going to be yours. But I just want to encourage you, don't sit in that shyness because life will go by very quickly. And then you'll look back and you'll wish and you'll have regrets. I want to encourage you, sweetheart. Uh, could some of you around her just lay hands on her for a minute? Yeah. We've got three of our ladies coming too. They're going to pray over you as well. All right. Destiny, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask for the impartation of boldness for you. you def the thing you need more than anything right now is boldness boldness no more fear God's not giving you the spirit of fear but of power love and a sound mind you have good things to give to God and the father says I love you but now give them be productive in your walk with Christ find avenues find ways volunteer for things get involved begin to move the Holy Spirit is like a rudder on a ship a rudder does the ship no good if the ship is tied to the dock right you got to push out, start the engine, start moving forward, and then the rudder can ste steer you and it can lead. That's the way the Holy Spirit is. Amen? So I commission you with boldness and courage to step out in the things of God, and God will start to use you, and you'll be blessed, and you'll be a blesser of other people if you take that challenge in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you, my dear. I hope you heed those words. These words are good for a lot of people. Amen? I think I'm done. Did anybody get anything out of church today? Yeah. Praise the Lord. I'm 30. Yes, I am 39. <laughs>